What's going on, Wolfpack? My name is Denarik Wolf, and welcome to some more Bosnian Reacts to Geography Now. Serbia, this time it has been too long, I think, since uh, the last time I did a recording. And you're probably wondering where the hell I've been, and you you probably didn't expect me in, in your subscription box today, I bet. But uh, to keep a long story short, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but... A few months ago, I contracted pneumonia, believe it or not, by inhaling some chemical fumes. I, uh, again, I won't go into details what happened there, but just an FYI, chemical fumes can actually give you pneumonia. <laughs> okay, so if you f smell something funky, get out of there. Better. And uh, uh, it, it takes a while to heal from pneumonia as well. I'm not 100% back in you know tip-top shape but I'm, I'm good enough to like uh, you know start doing recordings and get back to my normal way of living but again that's a story for another time i was horribly sick as you could tell and i couldn't do any recordings so that's why there were no recordings also by the way you're probably wondering was this behind me and uh actually i finally uh, finished my studio room that I've been wanting to make for a long time now. I pos postponed it uh, for obvious reasons because of my ailment, but finally, I finally finished that as well, and I have a nice studio. Hopefully the sound is very bassy, I think. Bassy? I don't know which one's the term, but... Oh, well. Let's uh, just get right into it. Uh, geography now. Uh, Serbia. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> But no, no, no. Trust me, <laughs> I'm going to be as unbiased as possible, okay? I'm going to make sure this... I, I, I do this episode completely unbiased, and I just focus on Serbia for what it is and not to, uh, about our, you know, mm, shaky past, I wouldn't say. Very bad past, but yeah, it's been shaky between Bosnia and Serbia. Uh, believe it or not, in the Middle Ages, they were actually considered... Friendly countries, yes, and they came to each other's aid sometimes. Well, they went to war as well, <laughs> but who didn't go to war with their neighbors in Europe, really? <laughs> but um, they actually came to their aid in the Battle of Kosovo, which is well known in Serbia. It was 1377, I believe, the Bitka na Kosovo. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was a good movie as well. You should check it out if you have the time, but... We came to each other's aid at that time, but I think the Bosnians bailed at the last minute for unknown reasons. But okay, well, let's just get into the episode. We'll talk about everything else later. Paul? All right. Out of all my subscribers, I think the ones that have been the most patient have been the Serbians. Ever since I made the Albania Serbia. episode and had the pleasant <laughs> experience of realizing the ramifications of making any kind of content pertaining to the Balkan subregion, Serbians have been emailing me for years wanting to help with the Serbia episode. And I, I get it. Serbia has quite a polarized reputation in Europe. It's kind of like, Boo! hey, show him some <laughs> respect. Do you remember what happened in the 90s? Yeah, I do. Here we go again. And polite. He was not cordial to me. I like yogurt. Oh, hush. Albania, Serbia's cool, plus Hoja was like 10 times worse than anything the Serbs did to you. You helped Hoja at one time. Yeah, but then you ditched us for China and that didn't even last and you were left isolated. I mean, he did kind of kill our Archduke starting World War One, but you know, teaming up with the Austrians was kind of weird to do. <coughs> anyway, so. Actually, that was a Bosnian Serb from our side, but basically. From Bosnian School, Grahovo. Oh, Serb Talica, right. Oh, yeah, great band. Yeah, quite. Serb Talica. Great <laughs> Sounds awesome. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. So as you know, I love having real people from the countries we cover in these videos. And with that, say hi. To None my of those friend, fake people. Zdravo, brate. <laughs> Just fact, brate. Okay, I'm gonna say one thing. Ivan is looks v stereotypically Serbian. I would tell from a distance like that. That's a Serb if I ever seen one. Uh, and also, uh, sorry for the lighting because. I didn't really think of the lighting when I was making the studio because it's not the best lighting at this point. But my lamp used to be pointing at a white wall and it would like brighten the room a bit so I would look very good. Even though I'm using a DSLR camera, I didn't fix the lighting. I'll fix it some other time, whatever. Just an FYI there. So you don't write in the comments, hey, generic wolf, what about the lighting? No, I know about the lighting. Okay. <laughs> Ivan, high school friend, we never hung out. Uh, usually Serbians would have like the name Jovan. Ivan is like, uh, well, I guess it's a Serbian thing as well, but usually they go with Jovan, which just means John, by the way, for those wondering, Ivan, Jovan, 
means John. There's also Jenan, Bosnian version. It also means John, all these names. John is actually the most used name in the world. Not Muhammad, like uh, some sources claim, but Johannes, Hans, all these different uh, variations of the name. John is the number one name in the world. Cool. We didn't hang out at all. Not at all. <laughs> then we bump into each other like, what, 10 years later, 15 years 15 later? years later, and uh, he yeah. remembered that I was Serbian. He said, guess what? I'm doing a video on Serbia. Do you want to be in it? And I was like... Sure. Ivan, explain. Who are you? What are you? Both my parents are from Belgrade, and uh, I have my dual citizenship. Belgrade, Janin. Right, you speak it. I do. I do. Uh, Don't right, Ivan, you this <laughs> Yes, I am. It's like we're walking into a death trap. Yeah, I'm Serbian. It's what we do. So get ready. We're gonna serb you up. A great new episode. <laughs> also, he's pretty tall. <laughs> Just like Balkan people really All right, are. We barely tall. started the episode. Not and me, already, though. <laughs> we're gonna jump into the most controversial part of the video: Serbia's domain. Almost none of it makes sense, and everyone just okay. Gets mad. I'm gonna build. Uh, I don't know. I made the Israel and North Korea episodes. Uh, we can probably handle this. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, so all, did I. <laughs> landlocked in the heart of the South European region ha, known landlocked. as the Balkans. The country is divided into 29 districts with the capital and largest city, Belgrade, located in the upper central part of the country, right on the Danube River. This is where you can find the largest and busiest airport, Nikola Tesla International. The second largest and busiest airport, though, is actually in the third largest city, Niche, Konstantin <coughs> the Great International, located in the southeastern part of the country. Road uh, you would notice a lot of, uh, like, uh... Byzantine Empire emperors' names around uh, Serbia because uh, around one fourth of like all of like or one fifth I think was of all like uh, Roman emperors were actually from modern day Serbia. It wasn't Serbia at the time, but you know a lot of them came from the area of of Serbia at the time, the province of the Roman Empire. I forgot what the province was called. I know Illyricum, and then there's some Serbian province, but. Before then, uh, before the Slavs arrived, before the Serbs arrived around, uh, Serbs are going <laughs> to hate me for this. I think, was it 8th century Serbs arrived or 7th century? I don't know. Well, some Serbs are full of pseudo-history and would claim that they've been there for thousands and thousands of years from the Vincek culture or whatever that weird, like, doll thing they found around Belgrade. But in reality, the Serbs arrived from a Slavic migration, like a lot of the South Slavs uh, have, excluding the Bulgarians. They have a little, little different history, but they arrived around 8th or 7th century. I don't remember now. I'm not a historian. <laughs> don't remember 100%. Yeah, so Serbs arrived at like 8th or 7th century. I don't know. I'm not an actual historian, like I said. So they arrived at the time. They started intermixing with other peoples that were living in the area at the time. And... Uh, you kind of get the modern day Serbian state. It, it, it shifted a lot in history. There was even an, a Serbian empire. I don't think Paul goes into detail, but there was a Serbian empire, <coughs> a fairly large empire that stretched all the way down to like Greece, almost like to, to Athens. So pretty impressive. And they even got close to Constantinople, but they were stopped at the gates of Constantinople. Uh, the well-known uh, Nemanjic dynasty, you'll hear that a lot in uh, Serbia, the, the Nemanjic dynasty, which were cousins of the Katromanic dynasties of Bosnia. Therefore, Bosnia and Serbia were, you know, friends at the time. And uh, yeah, and I believe they didn't, they weren't all Orthodox Christians, as you know today, Serbs are Orthodox Christians. They weren't like, well, obviously they were pagans at the time, but not all, all of them were, you know, Orthodox Christians. Some were even Catholic at the time until uh, Sveti Sava or Holy Sava, I guess they're Saint Sava, uh, converted them, you know, in, into Orthodox Christianity as we see today in, in order to like unify the Serbs, hopefully against uh, any other invading powers because Serbia was on a very flat plain Compared to other Balkan pla places, Serbia is on a very flat plain, so very attractive to, for invasions. And they have pretty attractive land, as you can see. They're very arable. They have uh, many navigable rivers, the Danube, the Sava, the Tisa, that all flow. Uh, they all make like a confluence around Belgrade. So that's an also why Belgrade is very important, you know, as a logistics hub on the Danube River. And uh, do I need to divulge any more information? Uh, for those new to the channel, yes, I am aware I talk a lot. I like to give as much information as I can. And I noticed uh, Paul didn't really talk about Serbian history that much. But actually, to be honest, Serbian history is pretty, in pretty interesting. Even from a Bosnian standpoint, they have a pretty interesting history. But I know there are 
I'm going to be like controversies in the comment section. I'm expecting it. But I like to be as unbiased as possible when it comes to history, even if it's uh, Serbian history, whatever. It's fine. Railways traverse every section of the country, the busiest highway being the A1. Railways are mm -hmm. everywhere as well, divided into main lines and branch lines. Now, Serbia has a lot of territorial anomalies. If you look at the Danube River border with Croatia, you will see the river has shifted flow directions numerous times over the decades, which creates newly formed mini Penne enclave river islands. The most contested ones being Sharingrad and Bukovar. Some islands are technically not even claimed by either side, which certain cheeky individuals have an opportunity <laughs> to jump in and claim for themselves as founders of a new micronation <laughs> like what happened with Siga Island and this Czech guy that came in and made his own country called Liberland. Later, Croatian authorities came and kicked him out. From there, you have pretty much mm. the same situation on the Drina River border with Bosnia and Herzegovina. Speaking of which, in the southwest part of the country, you have the pterodactyl-looking panhandle near Mistar that is only accessible by one Mistar. narrow roadway. And a little further off, you have the Medurice, Sastavsi, Bosnian and... Medurice, I think... It it can't be medure, medurecha. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it, which means between the rivers in in uh, Bosnian. Yeah, this is, Bosnia has an enclave for those who didn't know, and it's in Serbia. It's like a small town of like, I don't know, 20, 30 people or village, I should say, or hamlet, I should say, of like 20, 30 people. So it's still an enclave, so. Enclave, <laughs> but it's inhabited by Bosnian Serbs, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I told you, not easy. Not easy. Now, here's where things get a little interesting. The 29 <coughs> districts are kind of separated into three provinces made up of five statistical regions. The northern districts are collectively known as Vojvodina, and this area has a level of autonomy, as it is the most diverse part of Serbia, with six official languages and about a third of the population comes from 26 different ethnic groups. They have their own government assembly in Novi Sad, the second largest city, and maintain their own infrastructure, science, education, and culture laws. From there, you have the Central Serbia area, which has three other statistical regions. Belgrade, Shumadia, and Western Serbia, and Southern and Eastern Serbia. And now, folks, here's the really complicated part. You've all been waiting for it. If you ask the Serbian government and many Serbians, they will consider this last area oh, no. as part of Serbia, known to them as Kosovo and Metohija. <laughs> Kosovo, which comes from the Serbian word for blackbird, and Metohija from Greek Kosovo meaning land of monasteries. The thing is, this area is about 90% ethnically Albanian, and after the fall of Yugoslavia, this area has been a hotbed of secessionist movement and controversy. And Serbian law, on paper, treats Kosovo as another part of Serbia. After the Kosovo War in 1999, the UN Security Council established Resolution 1244, which temporarily put Kosovo under interim administration under the UN, but technically placed Kosovo's status as a meaningful, autonomous, and self-administering region of Serbia's claim until all parties could agree on a resolution to move forward. The problem is, decades later, there have been no resolutions made. Legislatively, Serbia has almost no rule or influence on the area and in 2008 Kosovo declared independence but the Serbian government did not rec uh by the way Kosovo flag <laughs> looks very similar to the Bosnian flag when I, I I watched uh when Kosovo declared its independence watched with my own eyes when they declared their independence and as soon as they brought that flag out I was like copyright claim right there because <laughs> very similar take a look at the Bosnian flag and the Kosovo flag you'll see what I mean but um uh yeah that's a hotbed of controversy now bosnia because we have a very complex political system can't come to an agreement on the the status of kosovo the bosnian croats and the bosniaks uh, of which i am uh wanted to accept uh, kosovo independence but the bosnian serbs in, in bosnia uh vehemently refuse and since there's no no agreement on what what should happen we just don't you know accept it or not accept it as a part of Serbia, in a, in a sense. So Bosnia is kind of neutral on this whole thing. So, um, yeah, uh, they go a little bit into detail in the video uh, about how uh, Kosovo managed to get 90% uh, Albanians instead of, you know, Serbs. But I will go into detail a little bit later when they start talking about it. I don't think they explained it that well. We'll see. Recognize it. It was even taken to the International Court of Justice, which ruled the declaration as not violating international law. Today, there is still a divided response from the international community. The recognition numbers tend to fluctuate over the years, some joining, mm -hmm. some withdrawing. But as of 2020, there are officially 97 countries that recognize Kosovo as a sovereign state, about half of the UN countries. However, to be admitted into the UN, you need a two-thirds majority vote. And if any of the main five nations veto, then the state in question cannot be approved. In this case, Russia and China have exercised yeah. their veto power. So, yeah. 
that's that. Explaining how things got this way will take forever. But long story short, you have to go back to <laughs> Yugoslavia. All the Slavic states of the Balkans, except for Bulgaria, were all a part of the former nation known as Yugoslavia. Based Bulgaria. Now, at the turn of the 20th century, Serbians and Albanians were a about equaling population in the Kosovo Metohian region. But during Tito years, it was like, well, we lost a ton of men from those wars, and the mineral and coal mines aren't going to extract themselves. We need a cheap labor force. I'll just bring in some more Albanians. And from there, the Albanian population grew even more, and by the end of the century, made up over 90%. Well, that's just one explanation, but it's a very long story of how the Albanians became a majority in the area. Now, that part is true where you started mentioned like uh, Albanians started moving in for work. I guess that part is true as well, but that's not the only reason. Now, one of the also big reasons is Serbs started to move out of that area into more prosperous parts of Serbia, notably Belgrade, Novi Sad, as you saw. And uh, here's a big one. Uh, Albanians in Kosovo started having kids like crazy. I'm talking eight, ten kids, while the Serbs still had like maybe two or three kids. The Kosovo Albanians, they had like ten or twelve kids, like, like I already said. And that inflated their numbers even more. And then there was, of course, the war that happened in 1999. Some Serbs probably fled the area. They mostly inhabit the northern areas of Serbia, but they're enclaves of, you know, Serbs all around uh, the Kosovo area today. Uh, a lot of important monasteries the Serbs would consider are in uh, Kosovo Polje. Uh, I, I keep saying Kosovo Polje. Kosovo. <laughs> Kosovo Polje is also where it got its name. Kosovo Polje meaning field. And... Uh, also, there was also an, an Italian occupation during World War uh, II, where uh, Kosovo was uh, then a part of, you know, the Italian occupied zone and not a part of Serbia at the time. And I guess uh, maybe some Albanians like moved in. I don't know. I'm not one. I'm not 100 percent sure. But that is a, a big factor. The fertil high fertility rate of the Albanians, which created an Albanian majority in in Kosovo and Serbs moving out to more prosperous parts of Serbia. Now, a lot of Serbs are, were also moved out from other parts of, uh, not not during war times, but during peace times, even after like World War II, a lot of Bosnian Serbs were moved into Vojvodina in northern Serbia, where a lot of Hungarians used to live and other nations, as you see, and they started to become a majority in there as well, in Vojvodina. Vojvodina is also a longer story. Like there are a bunch of giant migrations of Serbs during history. There are two great migrations of Serbs in history. One of them was like up, up towards uh, Vojvodina while they were fleeing uh, Ottoman persecution. So which you know caused the the fl uh, the fluctuations of Serbs all around uh, uh, Yugoslavia. In Yugoslav Republic times, all the ethnic groups got along <laughs> relatively well and at some point really did function like a pan-Slavic unit. In the last years though, it was kind of like... Comparatively, life is alright. I mean, we have basic life necessities, subsidized Medicare, and school is not bad. Hey, did you hear Tito died? Oh, I'm bringing back the motherland. From pst, which new countries ceded and... Well, also n not that simple, but the major factor, yes, was Tito, that <coughs> a strong man that held together Yugoslavia, but... Also, when Tito died, he died at the perfect time. Uh, nobody was taking care of the inflation in Yugoslavia. The economy started to crumble. There was a huge economic crisis. So people really weren't feeling the prosperity that much anymore. Besides, like, Slovenia and Croatia, which were relatively prosperous compared to the other uh, Yugoslav states. And um, in a sense, yes, but... What I want to say is that uh, the Yugoslav, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia that we know was really the Croatian version of Yugoslavia. Hear me out, because Croatians were always uh, uh, the Croatians that wanted the Yugoslavia preferred a federal Yugoslavia, which every, you know, country sort of governed themselves as a federal unit. And uh, the Serbs were more in favor of a centralized government from Belgrade, where Yugoslavia wouldn't be a federation, it would be more of a unitary state. Now, the other, you know, constituent peoples of Yugoslavia weren't for that idea. But so at the time of Slobodan Milosevic, the dictator of the 90s in Serbia that took over, you know, after Tito, in a sense, it was a socialist technically, but that's besides the point. 
Uh, basically, he tried to centralize the Serbian state even more because Serbia at the time had two autonomous provinces, Vojvodina and Kosovo. Now, he declared Serbia, you know, Belgrade to be, you know, have centralized power over these regions. Vojvodina, you know, accepted, you know, the, the rule of Belgrade because most of the people in Vojvodina are Serbians, but most of the people in Kosovo at the time were not Serbians. So you would have large protests of miners, especially the miners of the Trepce uh, mine, a well-known mine in uh, Kosovo, Trepce. Uh, you would have that, uh, and then you would have, uh, you know, Slobodan Milosevic coming to Kosovo and giving a famous speech of a lot of Serbian nationalism, let's just say, and that started to really get them riled up and then started the whole debacle of, you know, Croatia, Bosnia, and Slovenia. All the other uh, federal republics started to break off. There were wars. Not going to go into detail. That would be, I would be talking forever. And in 2006, Montenegro narrowly passed a referendum. It was like 55% of the people uh, wanted Montenegro to be an independent state of its own, a small independent state of its own <coughs> and Serbia ended up being landlocked right after that so uh and there's all the whole bunch of controversies with Montenegro as well with the whole Djukanovic thing but I don't, I don't really follow the politics as much as I used to uh than I what than I did uh, in my earlier days but there's a whole sort of debate going around Montenegro and uh Hopefully things have cooled down a little bit and uh, we can go back to living, living our lives. But Serbia did end up being landlocked at the time. It became independent within the following years. So, of course, as they were witnessing that, Kosovo tried to jump in and it was like... I mean, look, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, I mean, they all did it. Why can't I? Because, dude, you have always been an integral part of Serbia. It was the birthplace of our orthodoxy, a key part to the Serbian identity. Our True. most sacred monasteries and churches are there. Well, if you love the land so much, why did you sell so much of it to us Albanians and deliberately bring us in? Plus, Albanians have inhabited the Balkan Peninsula for millennia too. You're not the only ones. Are you, are you seriously going to go back to that Illyrian thing again? Uh, yeah, I am because we, we are go. descended from the Illyrians. That was just a theory and a weakly supported one. And even if you were descended from them, they live mostly on the Dalmatian coast on the Adriatic. Well, where do you think we came from? We didn't just Some pop in up Bosnia. out of nowhere. <laughs> and even so, it still predates the Slavic migration period. Within the Balkans as a whole, maybe yes. But within the Kosovo subregion, <laughs> not a chance. Okay. You, oh my god. Okay, you know what? Everybody's breaking away. Guess I'm, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it. No, you're not. Gonna, Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, yes I no. am. No, yo, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you win. Yeah, we just did that skit. For what it's worth, I wrote that skit based off of things. Yeah, so Serbia attacked uh, Kosovo at the time. And uh, then the UN, or specifically NATO, started to intervene because, uh, let's just say Serbia at the time was, or it was still, it was still a Yugoslav rump state, uh, was very controversial in the eyes of many Western countries. And they decided to bomb them, yeah. Serbia was basically bombed to smithereens and like 80% of their economy was destroyed at the time. A few thousand people have died in the bombings. The Serbians claim at least they even used depleted uranium shells as, uh, you know, uh, in some of the bombings and have caused like cancer rates to soar in some certain areas. Uh, look it up for yourself. You make uh, this, the decision for yourself. Is it real or is it not? I don't know, but... <laughs> Check it for yourself. Uh, if they did really use depleted uranium, that's bad. Yeah, because <laughs> radioactive, you know, radio radiation sickness, high cancer rates, etc. But that's just what the Serbs claim. You do your own research. You check it out for yourself. <laughs> Things that you guys, a Serbian and Kosovo Albanian geography, gave me information. I wrote it off of that, so it's your fault. All right. Well, so today's day and age, Serbs live in isolated pockets throughout Kosovo as minorities. Specifically, I got an email from geography Tamara, who is an anomaly. She's actually half Serbian, half Albanian. What? She goes to Kosovo all the time. Here's her explaining the experience. Hi, geography. I'm Tamara from. Serbia. Actually, I'm 50% Albanian because my father is Albanian and I have been to both sides. People, normal people, 
that are not involved in politics and war stuff. They're trying to move forward. I pretty much felt welcome. Not everybody. I spoke only Serbian because that is my native language and I don't speak any word of Albanian, unfortunately. They were like, wow, you're from Neither Belgrade. Neither do I. <laughs> wow, say hello to Belgrade. I used to live in Belgrade, etc. As long as we are normal and as, as long as we speak normally to between each other, there will be no problems. People are trying to live normally. <coughs> Thanks, Tamara. Well, that's enough for now. Some notable sites of interest you might want to check out if you go to Serbia include Petrovardin Fortress, the Skull Tower of Niš, the Nikola oh. Tesla Museum. The Skull Tower of Niš. Uh, a lot of that was uh, because of the Ottomans. I didn't talk about, I talked about Serbian history, didn't mention the Ottoman era, which was, Serbians would definitely say it was one of the worst eras, well, is the worst era of their history. Basically, for a few centuries, they were ruled over by the Ottomans after, you know, the Ottomans finally defeated uh, Serbia and later were, later Bosnia. Well, it's kind of the Bo Bosnia's fault as well, because the king of Bosnia at the time was married to the uh, queen of Serbia at the time, Maria I. I forget, it was Stepan III? I don't know, the final Bosnian king was married to her so he had control over bosnia and serbia and let's just say we ruined it serbia fell in like two weeks to the ottomans and then bosnia fell a few months later and basically the all of the nobility was slaughtered by the ottomans at the time and serbians created militias here and there especially the uh uh hang on let me just remember what they were called uh the hajduks the hajduks basically would go around in raiding caravans so you know intercepting uh Ottoman uh, supply lines and whatnot. So they still, in a sense, maintained a rebellion for many centuries after their, uh, after being conquered by the Ottomans. And uh, finally, in, in around the 19th century, late 19th century, they de officially declared their independence, and that's how the Principality of Serbia started. And to form, you know, until they formed the modern-day, like, Serbian state, later Yugoslavia and whatnot. The Krupaj Spring, Drvengrad Timber <coughs> Village, these ruins, ruins of the Yugoslav army headquarters, Tito's grave, Drina River Rock House, and probably the most iconic landmark of Serbia, the Church of St. Sava. Oh, and uh, also, Ivan, you were talking about Splavs. What I think that was that's the second largest like Orthodox church in the world. Just fun fact. What are those? Splavovi. Splavovi are pretty much river clubs, nightclubs. If you ever go to Serbia, be sure to check them out, and they're all on the rivers. Oh, and speaking of water, that brings us to the next segment, the... <laughs> Okay. I, I got an ad, by the way. <laughs> I guess, right? I mean, we're just going to talk about land, resources, wildlife, and so on. You can't really argue about that. Right? My favorite part. Oh, I'm sure we can find something to argue about. First of all, Serbia lies right at the crossroads of Central Europe and the Balkan Peninsula. Essentially, there are two main topographic regions, the flat Pannonian Basin <laughs> in the north half, which is basically this entire plain surrounded by a bowl-shaped perimeter. Mm -hmm. This is the flattest part of the country and with the most fertile land where the majority of agriculture can be found. From there, the south part of the country is made up of minor mountain chains, Balnik, Zlatibor, Serbian Carpathians, <coughs> and Balkan Mountains, which is where you can also find the tallest point within non-disputed Serbia, Mijor, at about 2200 meters high, which is split between them and Bulgaria. However, if you are a person that stands on the Serbia side of the Kosovo dispute, then you would probably say the Lika Rudoka, or as the Albanians call it, Maya Enjeriut, in the far south, is the highest peak at over 2600 meters. Yeah, there you go. We found something you could argue about. I told you we would. This mountainous area harbors the largest forest zones, national parks, and forest reserves, as well as caves and car systems in Serbia, including the largest cave open to the public, Rasava Cave near Yelovac, or the oddly shaped Devil's Town, the Voljavaros Rock Formation, with weird capped spires created by volcanic activity. <laughs> How did you pronounce that? The Voljavaros? Javoljavaros. Meaning like, yeah, Devil's Town. <laughs> so. ...a long time ago. The country has a ton of rivers, almost all of which drain into the mighty Danube, the longest river and the largest river that makes up <laughs> oh, yeah. the border with Croatia and Romania. Oh, it's the so longest long. river fully within Serbia, though, would be the Morava, which flows northward from the southern highlands. Due to the configuration of the terrain, Serbia doesn't have many large natural lakes, the largest being Vlasina in the south, which is technically a semi-man-made reservoir, only about 10 kilometers long. The largest man-made lake, though, would be the Iron Gates, which is essentially a reservoir created 
by the Iron Gate dams that serve power to both Serbia and Romania. The country is subject to occasional seismic activity, mostly in the south, with mild earthquakes usually reaching no higher than six on the Richter scale. That's about it for the natural side of things, and there's so much more that goes on into it. Yeah, and with that, it's time for our triple shot of espresso break from this Geography Now mug, more of which you can get at geographynow.com. Serbians do love coffee. Yeah. See, he knows me already so well. Noah, take it away. I love coffee. I'm trying to drink more tea. <laughs> Let's get to it, shall we? As far as natural landscape, Serbia has lots of intriguing hidden gems, such as the Ubats Gorge and river that twists into sharp Ubats, turns. Yeah. The Tisa River has that cool phenomenon in which mayflower insects come to mate for one day and die. For what it's worth, though, Serbia is an agricultural powerhouse. The abundance of rivers and fresh water make over two-thirds of the country arable, and about a sixth of the population is involved in farming. They are today the third largest producers of raspberries in the world. After Used to be Russia number one, Mexico, I think. And the third largest plum producer after China and Romania. Today, their economy is more heavily centered around energy, machinery, mining, and industry, mostly in the automotive parts sector. <laughs> you go. <laughs> makes up about a fifth of all export earnings. The country has notable reserves of oil, gas, and the fifth largest known deposits of coal. Tourism has been relatively more difficult for them compared to other European countries. But with cheap prices and countless places to check out, Serbia has been voted the number one emerging travel destination in Europe. Some hot spots are the remote nature reserves and outdoors. And with that, here's our animal correspondent, Gary Harlow. Here we go again. Oh, that would've been sick. Gary Harlow here! <laughs> in Serbia, for one, Serbia has five national parks, 10 nature parks, and 72 natural reserves. Oh, a uh, fun fact, I was born very nearby this national park. I was born in uh, Col where I originate from, close to the Serbian border. Just a fun fact. Yes. The mountainous regions are home Generic to wolf. <laughs> 90 plus species of mammals like vols, there can only be one. Otters, badgers, grey wolves, Eurasian lynx, and brown bears. 380 species of birds can be found here as well. Species like storm pestrels, egrets, storks, osprey, griffin, vultures, and the national animal, the European eagle. Fun fact, the country has over 30 species of bats alone. Many say have played Corona role bats. in creating the legends of vampires, which also <coughs> are recent or near birth for Orlando Bloom here, which also originated here in Serbia as well. Well, that's all for me. Thanks, Caleb. I mean, Gary, whatever. Moving on. All right, time <laughs> to end this segment as we always do. Food. Food. Serbia follows the Balkan oh, style yeah. of cuisine, so a lot of the food oh, you're yeah. about to mention can be found in other countries around Serbia, but with their Best own food, Balkan food. twists on them. Some of the dishes you guys suggest to be mentioned include things like, this is where we gotta get out of the uh, pronunciations, but alas. You do not have to read anything that's in parentheses. Pechenye. Pechenye. Hey, it's pretty close. Pechenye. I mean... Pechenia is not necessarily always pork. You can it can also be sheep as well. I Wedding guess. cabbage. Svadbarski kupus. Uh, that's more of a Serbian thing, less of a Bosnian thing. Stew. Ivar. White. Ivar. Oh, that's definitely a Bosnian thing as well. Oh, white beans. I just had white beans before I did this episode. Love it. Or pasul, as Serbians call it. It's grah. Come on, not pasul. Eh, whatever. <laughs> we we say grah in Bosnia. They say that down there, pasul. So. I don't know. Ivad is also like made from like paprika, so it's very good. Bean soup, gibanitsa. Gibanitsa. Eh, not a big fan, but you know, you can find that as well in Bosnia. Uh, that's more of a Serbian thing. We don't eat uh, pork. <laughs> barbecue meats. Muchkalitsa, barbecue meats too. That I don't know. I guess a lot of that's more of a Bosnian thing or Serbian thing, I guess. Baklava, okay, we have that a lot. Burek, don't even get me started. That's my favorite food right there. Though that's not really the type of burek you would find, uh, you know, around, I don't know. I haven't been to Serbia yet in my life, so I passed by there. I haven't been there. You know, chorba, of course, that's a type of stew or soup as well. Uh, but burek, you usually get that in a spiral shape and it's full of, like, uh, meat. It's, oh, it's so good. It's so simple, but so good. That's the best way I can explain Balkan food. All of what you see here is super simple to make. It's not super complex like French food or something. Anybody can make it. It's so good. Trust me.
affluent foods that came in from Ottoman times like sarma or austral sarma, huh? dishes like crawfish. Two of which are actually <laughs> probably considered the national dishes. 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 Chavapi <laughs> and Kara Gorjabash. Chavapi. Oh, yeah. The most important thing <laughs> shots of rakia. Something probable to unite all South Slav. <laughs> oh, I had this one like in my pantry somewhere. I was going to use it for the episode, but I couldn't find it at all. Oh, Shlivovitsa. Malo Shlivovitsa, that's. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> and they all love it. And speaking of the Slavic culture, that brings us to. Sorry about that. Thank you, Noah. Yeah, Rakia. The best kind is never bought. It's always homemade, right? Doma true. Why do you say homemade? It's domacha. And then it's doma true. Doma it's also used for medicinal purposes. They would rub it on my chest like a vapor rub. And speaking of. Yeah, and like when you have a fever, you'd rub it on your feet for some reason and the fever subsists i'm pretty sure that's like witchcraft or something and it's not real medicine but uh, one time when i had like a really bad cough uh, my dad would mix molasses with rakia and he would give it to me to drink and it actually works very well as like an, a cough suppressant it's true culture i asked some of you guys the serbian jogger peeps to explain what it means to be serbian and here's some of the things you guys said serbia I am loud, I am proud, I am a lot of the time Serbians consider themselves to be misunderstood. Serbians are Slavic people, but very influenced by the peoples who lived on the Balkan Peninsula before. We are considered to be the terrorists, vampires, but actually the truth is that we are maybe amongst the most hospitable people in the world. Actually, we really, really, really love to party and really, really love to drink, of course. In Serbia, like, we really, really love sarcasm. <coughs> Almost all our jokes are sarcastic. Um, basically, one of the most important traits of Serbia people and it's called inat so there is no quite good translation for this word like a trade that inat <coughs> well i think like the official translation would mean like spite or a grudge but really not really what that is well inat how should i say Inat is like uh, doing the opposite of what someone tells you to do. Basically, basically, it's like a don't tell me what to do attitude. That's what Inat is. Uh, by the way, Inat is, I, I came up with this, by the way. Inat is actually an acronym for idioti, naivni, aggressivni, tvrdoglavi. <laughs> Come on, it's, it's good. Come on. <laughs> basically, I thought of this. Uh, idiots, naive, aggressive, and... Uh, arrogant basically that it's not only serbs bosnians very much you know I'm, I'm, I'm talking to bosniaks as well very much we have the inat same as serbia very very same as serbian and i absolutely do not like it <laughs> that's one part of our culture is that i really don't don't like i don't like it i prefer a more chill culture and inat just kind of ruins it uh croatians less so they, they have less so but they still kind of have an inats but Croatians, uh, much less so to the Serbs and the Bosniaks. It makes you do or not do something just in order to prove something. Oh, well, if I waited one second, she would Inet. explain. Inet something <laughs> deep inside our blood. For example, you cannot climb that tree. Uh, you ain't gonna tell me what to do. I will climb, climb that tree right And away. break your neck. <laughs> Serbians are great people. And I say this directly Attila, to the Serbian hun. people. I wish that the Serbian people are more united with each other. Vreme je došlo da se držimo zajedno prijatelji moji. Idemo ka pobedi. Veliki pozdrav. Thanks, guys. In Does this guy assert who is that guy? Breakdown. The country has about 7.1 <laughs> million people, not including the disputed area of Kosovo, which has about 1.8 million, and has one of the highest aging populations with an average age of 43 years old, and about one-fifth of all households consist of only one person. The country is that made up primarily of ethnic <laughs> Serbs at about 83%. From there, not including the Kosovo population, the second largest group would be Hungarians at about 3.5%, mm -hmm. the Romani at 2%, and the rest are an influx of various other people groups like the Slovaks, Czechs, Croatians, Ruthenians, Romanians, most of whom live and Bosniaks you forgot to mention that about two percent are also Bosniaks in uh, Serbia but what I am especially around Novi Pazar and uh, Sienica Tutin a little bit Pjevlja like southern regions <coughs> what we what we call uh, Sanjak over here in Bosnia but Serbians would like to call it Raška we call it Sanjak and a lot of them like move into Bosnia uh, as well from from Serbia we actually have a migration from Serbia to Bosnia, especially the Bosniak population in, in Serbia. And there are also Bosniaks here and there everywhere, really. Mostly the southern regions of uh, uh, Serbia now. 
so just just to just just to FYI, there's uh, during World War One around half of the male population of Ser- or even more than half of the male population in Serbia was killed. Like they took the biggest losses of World War One. Uh, they actually surprisingly held back the Austrian Austro-Hungarians very well until Bulgaria then declared war on Serbia and they had they started to flee over the uh, Albanian mountains, uh, the Serbian army. Like anybody that could have been in the army was in the army in Serbia at that time, and they had a huge like widow crisis. I guess you can say like a lot of them, a lot of the men's and men ended up dying, and uh, they had to repopulate some quickly. I guess you can say, and. Uh, I guess even to this day, kind of that, that kind of echoes like this in the Serbian identity. Like they have to defend themselves all the time because look at that. Over half of their males were like a little bit more, and all of their most of their male males would have been dead. And I guess you can say Serbians would have kind of died out in that sense. So that's why they always feel very defensive and uh, uh, of their land or whatnot. So same goes for like the other peoples in the Balkans, not just them, but that just gives you an idea of uh, of of what Serbians have gone through during their history. In the North Vojvodina province. In Serbia, they use the Serbian dinar as their currency. This is what they look like. Cool. Money, money. We like making it rain. Oh. Anyways, they use the type C and F plug outlets and they drive on the right side of the road. Now, of course, the official language of Serbia is Serbian. Serbia. Which, if you didn't know, is basically the same language as Croatian and Bosnian and Montenegrin, <laughs> but they all swear they're all different languages. We already... Nobody swears that. Everybody knows it's the same language over here. Uh, in, instead of like a very delusional ultra nationalists, it's we all know it's it's the same language. We just can't find a good name for it because Serbians will say, "No, oh, just call all, all Serbian." All, or like, uh, uh, well, Croatians will say, "Hell, hell, no, it's also Croatian." Uh, and the, and the Bosnians will be like, "No, no, no, Bosnian as well." And even Montenegrins like, "Oh, no, no, Montenegrin is a thing as well." <laughs> But uh, they're basically the same thing, but we just can't figure out a good name for it. We can't call it Yugoslav, then it sounds like we're a one people again. But I say we call it the Dinaric language. Get it? Because we all live close to the Dinaric Alps. Okay, I don't know. It, it was a suggestion. Let me explain this in the Bosnia and Herzegovina episode. Another I was in that episode. Serbian identity would be the Orthodox Church. Everyone Uh-oh. respects it. The majority of Serbians identify as Orthodox, even if they're not particularly religious and they carry the crosses. It's they really aren't. They to for their roots. Well, one thing I should mention, <clears throat> like the S- Serbs I meet from actual Serbia proper, they're usually a lot more liberal. They're usually less religious than the ones in here in Bosnia. And if you want to see an, uh, a Serb Serb, then the Bosnian Serbs are more... Serb, Serb, <laughs> if you know what I mean. They're much more religious. Uh, they're they're much more nationalist. But, uh, oh, did that slip out? I think it did. <laughs> yeah, they're a lot more nationalist than <laughs> than those. But, uh, yeah, these are this is the famous Serb uh, uh, cross with the three Cs here. It's actually Cyrillic for an S, and it stands for Samo Serbi. No. Samo Sloga Serbina Spashava, there we go. Which basically see basically means only a accord will save the Serbs or only unity will save the Serb, I guess. Every family has their own saint. And they celebrate Saints Day or Slava. Huge <coughs> Also, uh what was that? Sorry, I'm coughing a lot. This thing? It's the Serbian three finger salute. Very big in Serbia. Like the Croatians, Bosnians, Slovenians, and the rest. They're all just Slavs. So why are they such a dysfunctional family? That would take ages to explain, not. but it kinda goes like <laughs> That's why right, fellow Balkan Slavs. How we doing? You guys are always like the expansionist military power that lords over us in the name of Pan Slavism when we didn't ask for it. In the moment one of us expresses even a slight sense of national you freak out and send in the tanks. Yeah, you're one to talk. Excuse me? Yeah, remember we were allied against Serbia, but then you totally backstabbed me in 93? You backstabbed me. I had like twice as many casualties from your attacks, all because you wouldn't let us use a gas station. You guys are just embarrassing to be around. Shut the f*** up, Slovenia, you snobby wine drinking bank liquidating client capital losing latin wannabe yeah i said it really north macedonia i'm not even technically part of this mess but you know you're basically just confused bulgarians i swear if you okay say that, my time to leave time, and if anything how come nobody talks about that 30 year long dictatorship in montenegro huh guys seriously okay 
Yeah, I admit it. I'm a little bit passionate sometimes. People sometimes can skew it as aggressive. Understatement. Maybe it's because I just wanted to hold on to and protect what we all started with. We were all just South Slavs, but history messed everything up. And maybe I like to romanticize the concept of pan Slavism, and I take it to the extreme sometimes. Understatement. Take it how you will. Ultimately, my underlying objective has always been that I didn't want us to separate too much. Is that so bad? Ghibli. Ghibli. Yeah, I don't there have you go. Well, no yeah, easy way to smoothly yeah, segue, Ghibli. so on a lighter note, let's talk about sports. Here's Art with the sports part. What's up guys, it's Art. I'm up in Washington State. This is where I'm from. Came up here to see my family. I'll be back soon, so uh, let's get into it. What's up guys, we are back in my mom's garage. Whoa, that's saturated. Like construction and dogs and like everything going on, so I'm sorry uh, for the background noise. It annoys me too. So, in Serbia, athletes are some of the biggest investments Novak in the country, Djokovic. and many have risen to international stardom. For one, the most popular sport is actually basketball, and uh, water polo would probably come in second. They are tied with the U.S. with the most world basketball championships with five wins each, and their men's water polo team is normally ranked first or second in the world, tied with Hungary. Volleyball is huge, too. Their men's team are Olympic gold medalists, and women's teams are 2018 world champions and three-time European champions. And finally, tennis has seen some immense growth and popularity with the recent success of players like first-ranked women's champ Yelena Yankovic with 15 WTA Yankovic. single titles. And of course, Close the enough. big guy everybody's heard of, world's number one men's single player, 17 Grand Slam <coughs> champion, Novak Djokovic. Oh, by, by the way, just a fun fact, he actually visited the pyramids in Visico recently. Uh... Uh, I don't know. I guess he's a believer of the pyramids of Isiko, but he came and visited. <laughs> so we were happy to have him. <laughs> Guys, I'm not Serbian, all right? Just give me a break. He's won so many titles in all of the major tennis open events, is the first male to win all nine Masters thousand tournaments. He's been on countless talk shows, can speak about five or six languages fluently, and has donated millions of dollars to charity. He is quite the charmer sounds like a really cool dude but you know what's not cool is that construction in the background and if they don't stop i'm gonna go somebody up right now all right back to you bar okay thank you art. art now moving on serbia is a land of extreme tradition customs and radiant celebration lots of stuff happened here so with that here's random hannah with culture stuff to this you'll get drunk on rakia pretty fast if you don't have a High alcohol tolerance, by the way. <laughs> beautiful Byzantine era Orthodox frescoes are some of the most prized artworks and relics of their past. Serbian weddings usually last days, followed by a ton of traditions, such as shooting the apple, drinking from the buklia, That's very and Serbian and glasses, shooting often stuff. <laughs> the best man and maid of honor take on godparent roles for future children. In many celebrations, of course, you might find the traditional clothing worn amongst men and women. Regions have different styles, but generally, Generally, you'll see the women's yellow vest on shirts with pleated wool skirts and embroidered aprons. For men, you'll see long shirts, wide pants, a gunya vest topped off with a shikacha cap. Like many of their Balkan cousins, Serbia is riddled with folklore, superstitions, and rituals. For example, Serbian moms will often chastise anyone in the house that leaves two windows open, creating the oh, yeah. or cold draft. That is a powerful breeze. It is considered bad luck to put any bag on the floor especially a purse don't sit on the corner of the table that. otherwise it is said you will not get married the orthodox faith often uses the julian calendar <coughs> meaning that for them christmas lies on january 7th loud church bells firing guns in the air eating off the christmas bread they even burn their christmas trees or more like christmas oak branches and the better they burn the more luck you will have we do that now in the mo we do yeah, we burn our Christmas trees. Put it in the, like, your outside fire pit. We don't think it gives you good luck. It's just fun. <laughs> Serbian Christmas is quite a spectacle of sights and sounds. And speaking of sound, now we go to Keith's terrible music segment. Turbo folk. <laughs> Remember, buy this face at geography. Turbo now. folk I'll, everywhere. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let people see my beautiful green eyes. Serbia in a nutshell. Music. Serbian music. music is rooted in Orthodox acoustic choir vocals. Some of the traditional instruments include things like these things, and probably the most well-known <laughs> traditional instrument, the gusle. Usually these songs are accompanied by the various types of Serbian traditional dance, the most commonly known one being the kolo, based on a simple one-two rhythm, but some other variants have more complex seven, 
to so basically explain it to you in a very simple way. I drew this really crappy drawing of what it would look like on sheet music. You could count it as one, two, one, two, one, two, three, because you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you got two. Yeah, but you do that dance here as well in Bosnia, but uh, it's going to be kind of embarrassing, but I actually don't know how to do that dance. It's, it's like a super simplistic dance, but I just don't have dents in my soul, I guess. Two and two and three, and that makes seven, right? Simple math. Math! <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, it's all that damn yogurt. All right, in contemporary Dang, music, Keith. this dude Something's is considered the founder of modern Serbian music. Since then, there has been a really interesting evolution that mixes traditional music with modern music. In fact, you can find it played at the Gucha Trumpet Music Festival, the second largest music festival in all of Serbia. The other being the Modern Exit Festival. In fact, Serbia even won the Eurovision Song Molly contest in 2007. Yeah. Serbians also are pioneers of ex good song. rock <laughs> bands and turbo folk, as described by geography Radosh. Folk music on cocaine. And also, I highly recommend you all to check out David Maximicic. He is a wonderful human being. What bands from Serbia do you know? All right, thank you all. Wow. <laughs> I don't listen to Balkan music. Thank you, Keith. And with that, here's the briefly condensed history segment. All those Greek, Macedonian, Roman, and Byzantine Empire things that oh, predated yeah. the Slavs. The great Slavic migration in the 7th century. This dude oh, was the 7th century. Okay, ruler. Christianity comes in. East-West schism. Serbs choose Orthodox. Lots of new kings. Random battles. Ottomans invade. Centuries of small domestic conflicts. russo turk <laughs> Yeah, there was even a, the, ba the war for Hum, which was the southern part of Bosnia today. Uh, which Bosnia took on the kingdom of Serbia at the time, and the Bosnian kingdom actually came out victorious at the time. Uh, Russo Turkish War, yep. Turkish War, Serbian kingdom reestablished, Balkan Wars, World War One, Austria Hungary, piss, World War Two, Germany goes ham on them. You will stop. Yeah, basically, uh, Germany occupied, well, a lot of the uh, territory was occupied by other countries, especially like Bulgaria occupied, like. Uh, North Macedonia at the time and some parts of uh, south southeastern Serbia, which even to this day, a lot of uh, Bulgarians live in, especially in the like the towns of Pirot and Dimitrovgrad. I think that's how you call it. You can find actually Bulgarians in in Serbia at the east, eastern side. You can actually find a lot of Laks that live there, which were basically like ancient remnants of Romans, I guess you can say. Some Romanians, some Slovaks, as you mentioned, a lot of Hungarians, especially up here in the north, around Subotica, that's where the Hungarians are. Uh, and uh, Bosniaks are down in the southern area. There's a little bit of maybe Croats here and there, and uh, that's about it when it comes to, like, Serbian demography. Established. Decades of Yugoslav awkwardness, but it kind of worked sometimes. Dissolution of Yugoslavia! Kosovo War. Montenegro secedes. Country works on trying to stay afloat during underlying controversies by making an image of being the party capital of Europe. And here we are today. Some of the top notable people from Serbia or of Serbian descent that you guys suggested we mentioned in this episode include too many former kings and royal family members. Oh, but I know a bunch of other historical figures like these. Uh, Mehmed Pasha Sokolovic, the word right there. Uh, hang on, I'll go back a bit. Alexander, okay, these are all the kings of uh, Karadžorđes, but there was a dynasty of Karadžorđe, Brenovic, that was the last dynasty of, uh, of Serbia. Kings and royal family members. A bunch of other... And Pasha Sokolovic, he is actually a <coughs> Serbian that, uh, if you notice, Mehmed is not really much of a Serbian name. Uh, Mehmed Pasha Sokolovic, oh, see, there's Saint Sava, that's the guy who uh, made them Orthodox Christians, all of them. Uh, Meh not all, not 100% all, but you know what I mean. Mehmed Pasha Sokolovic, he's from Visegrad in uh, Bosnia. Today, he was a Serbian that uh, uh, converted into Islam. And there's the uh, legendary bridge in Visegrad, the Mehmed Pasha Sokolovic bridge in Visegrad. Search it up. It's really, really, really cool. Historical figures like these. Scientists and academics like these. And most of all, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla is oh. Serbian. He is he Croatian. Is, no, Croatian, 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 Croatian. He's our, we He's claim Croatian. it. No. Yeah. So many actors and artists like yeah. these. <laughs> One of the most notable ones being Carl Malden. And also there's that lady who survived like the highest fall from an airplane and survived. Fun fact, did you know? Yeah, that was from a terrorist attack, uh, or assumed terrorist attack at the time. Uh, the bomb exploded. The she she was working as a uh, as a stewardess at the time. The plane exploded, but luckily, like uh, one of those like you know uh, carts actually pushed her up against the wall, and uh, she fell 
very deep down. She broke like all her bones. She was screaming and she fell around a, a modern day Czechia at the time. Luckily, uh, a former military doctor from Czechia heard her screams and came and helped her out. Luckily, he was a doctor, so he can immediately help her out. And she is the person that survived the lo largest fall ever, really, in human history. James Bond was based on a Serbian guy. Dusko Popov. Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> there is my 95-year-old grandfather who still is painting in Petr Modenovic. Oh, yeah. A lot of famous Serbs all over the world. And speaking of international affairs, that brings us to... Oh, yeah. This is going to be good. Now, it's been said that during Cold War times, Tito was the only man on Earth that successfully danced between both sides of the Cold War. Today, outside of Europe, the USA, Canada, Argentina, and Australia have the largest populations of Serbs in diaspora. Many moved during Yugoslav breakup times, the largest community living in Chicago, Illinois, USA, which is interesting considering that the U.S. was heavily involved in the NATO intervention of the Kosovo War. Nonetheless, the countries try their best to remain cordial. Now, of course, this means that Russia and China have been close as both stand on the Serbian side of the Kosovo conflict. China offers huge business and investment support, and Russia, as a fellow Orthodox and Slavic country, has always had a soft spot for the Serbs. They helped refugees during the Ottoman times and even gave them land in imperial territory of what is now Ukraine, called New Serbia and Slavo Serbia. In Africa, South Africa Didn't is probably the closest <laughs> friend as many South African resistance fighters trained in Serbia during the apartheid years, and today about 20,000 Serbs live in South Africa, mostly in Johannesburg. Nelson Mandela was even made an honorary citizen of Belgrade. Cl uh, regarding uh, the Russian and Serbian alliance, uh, it goes back, well, a long time, but especially during World War One, when Serbia and Russia, as you know, were allied. And Serbia not answering the call of the Austro-Hungarians to their ultimatum. They, they accepted everything as, except for like one uh, point in the ultimatum where it said like they wanted to have their police force uh, occupy like belgrade or something i think that's what the serbians didn't agree on because basically they're going to turn you into a vassal so of course serbia didn't agree to that and uh, because that was an ultimatum austria austro hungary or uh, at the time austria hungary uh, attacked serbia and uh, russia russia and serbia being in the alliance they uh, started mobilizing for war russia started to mobilize for war and of course germany then started to mobilize and the whole Thing went to hell. That's World War One. <laughs> Closer to home, though, because of historical controversy, Croatia and Bosnia are on paper enemies. But in reality, today, when people from these countries meet, it's like everything. Uh, politic, in the political sense, I would say rivals. I don't about. I don't know about straight up enemies, but rivals. Yeah, I guess. Uh, in the political sense, no, we're not doing that good. Let's be honest. But in in the people sense, yeah, we're doing pretty good. Oh, I like those shots at Ekia where it comes in like a vial. <laughs> so Slops, and they're just Balkan slabs. The only difference is the religious background and maybe a few minor cultural differences, but otherwise they get each other. When it comes to their best friends, however, most Serbians have told us <laughs> two countries, Montenegro and right. Greece. For Montenegro, it is often said Greece. the two are two eyes in the same head. They share lots of history. They saved each other many times in wars. Lots of people intermarry and have property or businesses in both countries. And even though Montenegro is pushing a separation from Serbian identity movement, they can't deny the closeness they share. For Greece, not only do they share the orthodox thing, but they've always kind of helped each other in history, whether it was against the Ottomans. Yeah, that's Greece what I wanted to say. The only NATO country to refuse cooperation in the Kosovo dispute standing with Serbia. Today, most Serbs go to Greece all the time for vacations, where they are welcomed with open arms. They share the same laid back, dark humor. And when they meet, it's like an instant connection of powerful Balkan bond few nations in the world can understand. And for the conclusion, I think, uh, Ivan, you should take it away. Whoop. Centuries of dramatic events have led to the Serbia today that is stuck in between yeah. moving forward with one hand grasping to the glory days of the medieval Serbian kingdoms that are a frequent source of inspiration. So many things that have happened yet nobody gets a full answer and nobody fully wins anything. In the end, we're just a group of South Slavs. That's all we can say. We are Serbs. Zhivoli. Zhivoli. Stay tuned. Seychelles is coming up next. Okay, uh, after the Serbia episode, I'll probably end up doing Singapore next because for those who aren't uh, informed, I will only be focusing on the countries that I would consider important enough to do an episode on. So we will be moving on to Singapore next, maybe in the next ne next week, but no promises, maybe. And uh, with that, all that is left is... 
and uh, the flag of Serbia. Let's go. Hey everybody, welcome back to Flag Slash Trend Friday. Hope you liked the Serbia episode. Um, by the way, yes, you can get Geography Now shirts at geographynow.com or a Geography Now mug or whatever. There's only like 10 <laughs> options on the website, so we don't overburden you with options. It's not selling out if it's my brand. Anyhow, as you know, this is the part where we talk about the small mistakes we made in the video or the things that we didn't mention in the video. Uh, for one, around the 22 minute, 48 second mark, I accidentally put up a picture of a political celebration rally thing when it was supposed to be like a concert. It wasn't a concert. But a lot of you in the comments didn't were a even upset notice. that we didn't talk about Romania's friendship with Serbia. They've never really had any serious conflict between each other. And overall, they've yeah. been really close friends. I mean, we even mentioned it in the Romania episode. We just didn't have time to talk about it. Also, in regards to the Kosovo thing, I do have to address this more objectively. We did put little captions, but I feel like it maybe wasn't enough. Although, yes, Tito did bring in Albanians during Yugoslav years. That's not the reason why Kosovo <laughs> oh, became an mentioned Albanian it. majority area. In fact, Albanians had been living there for centuries before. Kosovo has always kind of been like a diverse area and the numbers had always fluctuated however the major albanian growth didn't happen until the 20th century uh according to a 1455 ottoman cadastral tax census the area of kosovo had 13,000 serb dwellings and 48 albanian dwellings but then jump forward to the 20th century a german scholar gustav weingand gave a statistical report in 1912 before tito which recorded about two-thirds albanian and about a third serbian so before tito years it already was was a majority of Albanian. There was a lot of war, a lot of people were killed, but that stuff takes way too long to explain and everybody disagrees on everything. I'm just here to report the numbers of what they were and what they are today. That's all I can do. Anyway, some other stuff we didn't mention in the episode include things like, uh, they have the world's most expensive cheese, pule cheese, made from donkey milk. Uh, 17 Roman emperors, or about fifth of all Roman emperors, ah, were born right. in the areas of what are now Serbia. Serbians greet each other with three kisses on the cheeks. He also forgot to mention the fact that Serbia had an empire oh, yeah. short-lived. There we was go. It? it was between 1346 and 1371. It extended all the way to Greece and parts of Bulgaria. But not Bosnia. Yeah, that's about <laughs> it. If there's other stuff I forgot, feel free to write it in the comments, which is going to be very productive and conducive to a civil discussion. But anyway, we got to move on to the flag. So without further ado. <laughs> Ah, Serbia. I had a lot of fun filming with Ivan. So funny. Yeah, we went to the same high school, never really talked or hung out. I think we had one history class together, and that was it. Funny how life kind of throws you those little curveballs. Anyway, moving on. The flag. The flag of Serbia is a horizontal tricolor of red, blue, and white, with the coat of arms offset from the center a little, closer to the left or hoist side. We'll talk about the coat of arms later. But in regards to the three colors, these colors are essentially the pan-Slavic colors, which are commonly found in other Slavic countries used during the revolution era movements of the mid-1800s. It is often agreed and said that the white stands for the light and radiance of the nation, the blue stands for the clear blue sky, Here we go. and the red... <laughs> Stands for... Ah, you knew it was coming. Thank you, Potter Potts, our favorite Irishman, for making that animation. There's a lot more that goes into the flag. Like, there's a legend that says an envoy of Serbian soldiers went to Russia, and then during the parade, they were asked to represent Serbia, but they didn't have a flag, so they just flipped the Russian flag upside down, but there's no, <laughs> like, confirmation behind it. Cool. Yeah, could be true. I don't know. Either way, cool story. Historically, they've had a lot of other flags. Also, important to note, Vojvodina has their own flag. It was made in 2004. And uh, each of the three stars represent, what was it? Srem, Banat, and... And Bachka. But yeah, as an mm -hmm. autonomous region, you know, they kind of got their own thing going on. You'll see that flag everywhere. Anyway, yeah, so much goes into it. Let's move on to the coat of arms. The coat of arms is a red shield with a double-headed eagle on it. The double-headed eagle has been an image used since medieval times, getting as far back to the 14th century. Within the Well, uh, double-headed eagles on flags usually represent, usually uh, represent one head represents the state, while the other head represents religion, basically. That's what you, that's why you see a bunch of these double-headed flags. Mini shield on the eagles is the Serbian cross, which contains a cross and the Serbian seas or fire steels, which look like these things, which are fire steels made to make fire. And it is said that each of the seas stand for the words Samo Sloga Serbina Spasava, which means only unity can unite the Spasava. Serbs. Although today the country is a republic, they still have the crown and the fleur de lis as symbols hey, that allude Bosnian to the flag had that. of the country. Over the years, the coat of arms has changed a few times, but 
in general, they've always kind of kept the double-headed eagle and the Serbian cross. Uh, there was a very brief time when the <laughs> Habsburgs were like fighting and then they had like a flag with a boar with an arrow through it. But in general, yeah, double-headed eagle, Serbian Orthodox cross thing. Now you know. And so yeah, that's about it. So now you know there's only one thing left to do. It's time for... Yeah. The end of the video. So, ooh, I haven't done this in a while. Uh, too bad about my camera dying there at the end. But, uh... Uh, besides that, yeah, it feels good to be back. Uh, I have nothing else to say. This is the end of the uh, episode of Serbia. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in uh, in the Singapore episode. All right, bye.